Hi again. Uh, to respect time, let's begin. Um, my name is Amira. I am based in Puerto Rico, and I'm uh, the U.S. Um, national organizer for 350.org's Fossil Free Campaign. And uh, I want to present our talented trainers for tonight, Yumi and Jeremy. Um, uh, can you say where you're based, what organization do you work for, a fun fact about yourself, whatever you want. Um, sure, I'll start. Um, hi, I'm Umi Hawk. Um, I work for the Sierra Club based in Oakland, California. Um, I'm the Distributed Organizing Manager of Digital Strategies over here. Um, and a fun fact about myself is that um, I'm scared of birds. Cool. Hey everyone, my name is Jeremy Orr. I'm uh, the state program director with People's Climate Movement. I am based in Detroit, but end up getting you know all over the country, especially now that you know we're you know six weeks out from September eighth. And a fun fact about myself, um, man, I am learning how to speak Spanish right now. So that's kind of like taking up my free time. I'm getting there. Awesome. I support. The Spanish language, obviously. <laughs> if you need help, let me know. Um, so I am gonna copy in the chat um, the slides, so you can follow them. Um, uh, please let me know if you can access them. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about coalition building and inclusive engagement. And our training agenda starts with uh, us talking about intersectionality and climate justice, then how frontline communities and communities of color are impacted more by climate. And then we'll review the MS principles followed by talking about best practices for building a diverse coalition. Um, we're gonna uh, go and have a exercise in breakout groups, then we'll come back to watch a video and share learnings from the video, and then uh, we will close this training space. But before we start, um, I want to ask everyone uh, to please write in the chat, um, where is your RICE event? Where in the world? Um, so just so we get to know each other and where we're coming from. And if you're on the phone, feel free to mention it. Um, since you can't see the chat. So we have Portland, Singapore, Columbus, Georgia, San Francisco, Boise, Boston, Somerville, near Boston, I, I think I didn't miss anything, but if I miss reading one, please let me know. Um, so the training objectives for tonight are first review best practices for building a diverse coalition. And we're gonna learn about best practices to include and amplify communities of color um, that we will also provide resources on inclusive and relevant messaging and understand how frontline communities and communities of color are impacted. And I'll hand it out to Yumi. Thanks, Samira. Um, 
before we get too much into the best practices and digging into the practicalities of how to build coalition and work together, um, I wanted to start just by talking a little bit about intersectionality um, with the intention of kind of rooting us all in a shared understanding of the links and connections between issues which are actually caused by systemic injustices, um, which hopefully will help address the question of why do, why do we work together in coalition? Um, so if you're looking at the slides, I'm on slide five, um, but currently there are all kinds of problems in our society, which I think we're all aware of, um, but that obviously includes climate change, racial and social justice issues, um, issues with our unfortunately broken democracy, um, and increased income inequality, so issues related to minimum wage, CEO pay, health care, all those sorts of problems. Um, but upon reflection, all of these problems are actually connected. Um, and as many say, my liberation is actually truly bound up in yours. Because as you can see from the Venn diagram, issues of climate change are directly related to issues of race and economic justice and ec economic inequality. And it's because the actual problem that we're trying to identify and deal with is the fact that power has been consolidated and wealth is accumulated in the hands of the few. And they are the ones who get to make decisions um, about what is happening in our society. And they're the ones that are trying to divide us issue by issue when we know that it's going to take all of us together addressing these root systemic problems to actually create the type of future that we want to see. Um, so when we work together in coalition, what we're doing is we're working together to address the intersectionality of these issues and to recognize that they are interlinked and interconnected. Um, and other people might be motivated by different aspects of the systemic issue, but the solutions are interlinked. So when we're looking at working in coalition to address problems, what we can do is we can come to unified solutions that are looking at inclusion, cooperation, regeneration, and democracy that reflect our communities and our community's needs. Um, so we can address climate change by recognizing the systemic problems that have created climate change and the impacts that that is having on other people um, and the need to um, address these issues in a way that ensures cooperation. So basically, we have to recognize the links that we all have together and tackle these problems together. Um, and in many ways, it's actually most obvious, ooh, the screen's changed, um, when we're thinking about climate justice and, and racial relations. Um, so just to kind of dig a bit deeper in terms of communities of color and frontline communities and how they're impacted by climate change, um, if you think about uh, communities of color, there are more landfills, hazardous waste sites, and other industrial facilities are located in communities of color than there are in other communities. So a report that came out recently reviewed data collected over a 20 year time period and found that more than half of the people who live within two miles of a toxic waste facility are people of color. Um, because of that, because these communities tend to be in these locations, they have exposure to higher rates of air pollution than white non-Hispanic counterparts. For instance, a recent case study of the Bronx, New York, found that individuals who live close to noxious industrial facilities and waste sites were actually 66% more likely to be hospitalized and have amnesia. Um, not only that, but lead poisoning actually disproportionately affects children of color. Um, children of color who live in urban areas are the highest at risk for lead poisoning. Um, and a study by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention found that 11, 11 11.2% of African American children and 4% of Mexican American children were poisoned by lead. In comparison, only 2.3% of um, white children were. And of course, that has long lasting impacts beyond just getting lead poisoning in terms of um, amne um, the potential for getting anemia, seizures, brain development issues, all sorts of things. Um, What's, what's probably obvious by now, but what, um, what this actually means is that climate change is disproportionately affecting low income communities and communities of color. So things like extreme weather conditions um, have devastating consequences for communities of color and low impact communities, and especially because they don't have the economic means to recover. So extreme weather events can displace residents and at times cause death. And in the aftermath of such efforts, if you don't have the financial means to actually be able to um, provide solutions for your family, you can imagine what happens then. So um, in, and in response, city officials, when they're trying to rebuild for communities of color, tend to um, put less resources into that as well. 
Um, and finally, in, in regard to all of these examples, um, water con contamination plagues low income areas and communities of color across the nation. Um, studies have documented limited access to clean water in low income communities of color. Um, water contamination has largely affected children of color who live in rural areas, indigenous communities, and migrant farm worker communities. Um, and I'm sure many of you have been following and um, are aware of Flint, Michigan, and areas like that, where there are ongoing problems for communities of color in regard to water. Um, so I appreciate that I've been talking for a long time, but take a moment right now to think about how climate change impacts your community or communities that you can think of. What's an example that you can think of of communities of color being impacted by climate change? Um, feel free to type your response in the chat. Yeah, wildfires in poor rural areas in Oregon, definitely. Well, while y'all are thinking, obviously I mentioned um, Flint, Michigan earlier. Um, there was an example recently um, with water contamination around the Navajo Nation where they've been suffering for years around water contamination. Yes, the many hurricanes that seem to be coming at increased frequency um, definitely are impacting lower income communities more strongly than others, um, especially in terms of recovery efforts. Um, Amira, I know you're in Puerto Rico, so I'm sure there's a lot you could tell us about what the communities are going through there, but definitely a very good example. All right, I'll keep moving on, but just keep thinking about that question and reflecting on if there's any examples that you can think of while we're continuing through this training session. Um, so now that we have an understanding of why these issues are connected and how they all um, are, are, our solutions need to be connected because the, the problems are so connected. That's why it's so important to work in coalition with those who are most impacted. And one of the ways that we can do that is by utilizing the Hamez principles. Um, so I'm just going to spend a minute right now going over the Hamez principles. Uh, many of you might have heard of them before, um, but just so that we're all rooted in this um, in the principles themselves. Um, they were written and, uh, by about 40 people who met in Jumez, New Mexico and adopted these principles. Um, and there are six of them. The first is to be inclusive, which is to include everyone at every level. And not just tokenizing people, but actually ensuring that their voices are valued and recognized for the contributions that they're giving. Um, and not just that there's a person there who looks or is from a certain demographic. Um, an emphasis on bottom-up organizing, so reaching out to new people at all levels, building and strengthening our base, and working off of what the base wants and what, um, what's being reflected from pe those people who are most impacted and living in those situations. Um, to let people speak for themselves, so the people who are most impacted, the most affected, they should be heard, and they should be standing front and center, um, and they should be the ones who are actually vocalizing what's going on. Um, number four is working together in solidarity and mutuality. So working in collaboration and incorporating each other's goals and issues to ensure a stronger future. So we're actually building relationships that are recognizing that the need for cooperation and the need for long-term cooperation. Similarly, number five, build just relationships amongst ourselves. So being just and honest with each other and developing strong relationships that um, recognize the differences that we may have, but also the need for collaboration and how we'll work together. Um, and number six, a commitment to self-transformation. -trans um, recognizing that we have all existed within a society that isn't necessarily reflective of the Hamez principles and that we as individuals may need to stop being so individualistic and focus on community-centeredness and a larger, um, a larger vision for society that may require some self-transformation and self-reflection along the way. Um, the links to this document will also be available for you after this training. Um, and now that we've talked a little bit about the intersectionality and reflected a bit on the, some examples for communities of color um, and Hemez principles, I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thank you, Umi. Um, you know, again, everyone, my name is Jeremy Orr. I'm with the uh, People's Climate Movement. I serve as a priority state program director, which means I'm managing all of our, um, you, know, what, you know, what we'd say our coalitions and, and our states around the country are putting on September 8 RISE events, as well as 
uh, you know, doing some deep diving in, in voter engagement work uh, through these uh, you know, midterms here in, here in the U.S. Uh, what we're going to talk about, you know, today is, is really, you know, how to build a, a diverse and a really sustainable coalition. So what we'll do, we'll kind of do this in two parts. We'll, uh, you know, review the first slide that everyone should be on. Uh, we'll break out into small breakout groups and take about five minutes to address some prompts that uh, I'll give instructions on uh, in a little bit once we get to that point. And uh, then we'll come back together, uh, share out, and, you know, finish up this portion of the uh, of the presentation with kind of a, a part two, which would be the third slide in, um, in this portion of the agenda. Uh, so to, you know, give you a little background about myself, uh, you know, prior to PCM, I spent a lot of my time in uh, grassroots-based organizing, institution-based organizing, uh, really in a space of coalition building, uh, particularly around environmental and climate justice for, uh, you know, for years. And, um, you know, prior to entering this space uh, with PCM, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of work around uh, workers' rights organizing and coalitions, kind of black and brown coalitions uh, who were, you know, putting together interfaith communities and, um, and workers in a worker center setting nationally to build up a coalition to address those issues. Um, and, you know, there are a number of things that, you know, stood out to me about coalition building. So there are kind of six key points that, you know, I'd like to talk about today. Um, you can follow along uh, through the slide. So the first one, you know, is, is really just, you know, I guess, what are partnerships and, and why are they important, right? And so, you know, as you, you know, read along, right, they're strategic partnerships, you know, you form with other institutions and organizations in order to win on your issues and build and shift power. I think it's important, you know, to recognize that the purpose of these coalitions are just that, right, to, to build power, right? And, and power, you know, for us in, in this setting is really the ability to act and, and the ability to move people and targets so that we can win on a number of these issues, in particular this issue, right, climate action, right? Are we partnering with folks to actually uh, do something meaningful and, and get our elected and appointed officials and stakeholders and decision makers to uh, act, right, in our favor? Um, you know, other component of that is just, you know, partnerships bring, uh, you know, the power of other organizations into our campaigns. And, um, you know, when your organizations don't have, you know, the power to, to move, um, you know, to move your target. And what that means is, you know, oftentimes it's easy for us, you know, as individuals and uh, leaders and stakeholders of organizations or even in communities to uh, get in our silos, right? We're, we're, it's easy to, to, you know, stay connected with our communities and, and try to move, you know, decision makers in, in that realm, but at some point, you know, it's significant, you know, to recognize that, you know, we may not always have the capacity, um, you know, the resources and, and the power to actually move our targets. And that's when it becomes, you know, key to, um, to think about, you know, what role can partnerships play uh, in the work that we do? What role can, you know, building relationships with others, you know, play in that? So, and the other, you know, component of that is, you know, just understanding that broad-based partnerships build enough power to withstand opposition forces and win campaigns. So that's the other, you know, significant component here is that um, when we're building these campaigns and building coalitions, you know, we aren't just simply, you know, looking to move targets and, and get favorable decisions, but we're also thinking strategically through what's, you know, what are the barriers, right? What's going to stand in our way and more than the what, you know, the who, right? Because there are, you know, people on, on the other side of, of our fight who, um, who don't necessarily agree, right? Don't agree with the same science, right? Don't agree with the same laws and, and, and don't agree with, you know, some of the same you know, theories that we have and, and recognizing that when we're in partnership, the focus is to also, you know, build a base large enough to, to you know, to fend off attacks and, and oppositions to, you know, win some of these campaigns that uh, we're going to be working on, you know, around the, not just around the country, but around the world, you know, particularly around climate action. Um, you know, and, and the second, you know, piece of this is really, you know, what do we uh, bring together in partnership? And this will be one of the props that, you know, we, you know, I hope you all can, can talk about in uh, the breakout groups. But when we think of, you know, what do we bring together in partnership, right? We bring together uh, the power of institutions. And thinking of institutions, there are a number of types of organizing, right, that we've all probably engaged in or, or if you're new to organizing, right, understanding that there are many types, right? You have the field organizing, you have the traditional community organizing, um, you have distributive organizing, but there's also, you know, what we call institution-based organizing. And institution-based organizing is essentially, um, you know, how do we identify and locate, you know, institutions, organizations, community stakeholders that already, you know, 
exist, right, but simply need to be organized, right? So is there, you know, a, a community organization or association in your neighborhood? Is there a, a local chapter of the, you know, Sierra Club or, or 350 in your community that exists and, and would be looking, right, exists as what we call an institution and be looking to engage in this work uh, along with you, right? So it's about bringing together already existing institutions, um, you know, in the partnership. And that partnerships, you know, include, you know, one to several organizations, and they come together to win a distinct campaign or to, as we mentioned already, right, build and shift power uh, over time, right? So that sometimes can look like uh, just one other, you know, organization um, or one other, you know, person to come in partnership with. But, you know, I've been in situations where it's been as, as many as, you know, two dozen partners. And of course, you know, you can imagine that gets difficult to manage at times. But when you have a lot of stakeholders who are impacted by the issues that you're working on, it's important to have those voices at the table uh, lifted up and, and find ways to build consensus and work through it. Um, but understanding that a partnership doesn't always have to be uh, some massive, you know, partnership of, you know, dozens of, of organizations. It can simply be one or two other organizations who are um, moving and going in the same direction of you and, and, and looking to work on uh, those issues and have the same targets and looking to win the same campaigns as you. Uh, and then third, I think we need to think about, you know, how do we know, what to bring into a partnership. So it's, you know, talk to others who have a stake in the issue and figure out you know, what their self-interest is and what they could bring to the campaign. Uh, these are, to me, two of the most critical points of uh, organizing and coalition building and, and partnerships all together. Um, you know, pulling out the talk to others and self-interest, right? The talk to others is really about building relationships. So when we think about you know, talking to others, it isn't just simply surface level outreach, but it's our re-engaging community stakeholders, um, you know, in meaningful conversations and inviting them to, to something that they absolutely want to be a part of. And the other component of that is uh, understanding what their self-interest is, right? And, and organizing, you know, my, my understanding has always been, you know, folks don't move and, and, and folks don't come to the table unless uh, their self-interest is identified and they can recognize their self-interest being met. Uh, in that, you know, relationship or in that coalition that they're joining. So essentially, if I can't, you know, or if a person can't, you know, look at your partnership and coalition and, and see that their interests, right, their, their meaningful interest is going to be served, then chances are they won't be deeply invested. So it's critical, you know, for us as, as organizers and leaders and coordinators to make sure that as we're calling people to the table and inviting people to the table, you know, these stakeholders that we're talking to and building relationships with, that we also understand their self-interest. I think, you know, the easiest way to do that is simply to ask stakeholders, you know, directly, what do they need to get out of the work together, right? And that may sound pretty straightforward, but I think, you know, it's important to um, be clear and direct and make sure that, you know, folks are at the table, are communicating to you what they need out of this, what, what they're working towards and what they want, and that also that you're creating uh, a space in which you feel comfortable sharing uh, your direct needs and, and desires out of the work that you're doing together. Um, so really you know, focusing on being clear and direct and asking folks what their self-interest is when, when you do lack clarity on that. And at the, at the moment, before we go into breakout groups, are there, you know, are there any uh, particular questions that, that folks may have or whether you want to type into the, the, the chat at all? Right, so what we'll do now is go into um, the breakout group. So uh, you'll be split into breakout groups um, according to our, our, the person who's managing, uh, assisting and running the, the, the uh, Zoom call today. So these prompts are essentially uh, what we just went over before, right? In particular, questions two and three, right? So the first prompt would be, you know, what do you hope to bring together in the partnership that you, that, you know, that you are building? And then also, you know, how do you know that it is what the partnership needs and what steps uh, have you or will you take to determine those needs. So like we just talked about, you know, what, what's the purpose of uh, your partnership and what are you building? And we identified some of those points of what should be considered. And then also just simply, you know, how do you know that, you know, it's what your partnership needs? Have you, you know, talked to folks um, and what have they talked about? So uh, just sharing that, I think the you know, way we'll do this is we'll spend a total of five minutes in our small groups just responding to, to each of these prompts uh, in our small groups, what we're thinking is each person uh, in your breakout group should have uh, an opportunity to share, you know, during the course of this five minutes. And what would be ideal is if one person in your breakout group could 
uh, be identified to take notes and, and be the person that uh, responds um, to kind of briefly report back when we come back from our breakout group. So just were there any common themes in, in the you know, things that were shared, the stories that were shared, the, the tactics that we're going to be using to identify, you know, partners and their needs uh, and determine what those needs are. So at this point, we are going to uh, split into our breakout groups and um, come back in five minutes. It looks like we are, we split in our folks in breakout groups. Yeah, I, I don't know if you want me to add you to a breakout group or if you're fine having them discuss on yeah. their own. Yeah, I think, and how many groups are there? There's three groups. There's um, two with two people and one with three people. Okay. And then Zoom has a thing where you can kind of prompt people like there's like a minute left or something like that. Is that? Yeah, I, I can send them a message, I, I guess. We have time, so I can give them like six, seven okay. minutes if they want to talk more. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Yeah, I'd send them a message at 8.35 telling them they have a minute. Okay.
I just sent them out the one minute message. Okay, cool. And you said there were three three groups? Yeah. Okay. So it has two people and one has three people. Okay, good. Just trying to think through how uh, we could do report back, but since it's only three, that it should be pretty pretty easy. And then who's giving me, I see the example story. What about the example story? Well, um, is somebody talking about that? Yeah, you may. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna close the breakout groups now. It says they're coming back in 45 seconds. All righty, welcome back everyone. So what we're gonna do now is, um, so we had three groups, so we're gonna just have one person from each group maybe talk about what they shared and, and any, of the, um, any of the common themes that you know, came up during, the, you know, during their conversation with their partners in their group. So if we wanna, if we wanna just start with, um, Maybe have someone type in the chat, the person who was responsible, just star in the, in the chat and we can go in order of, of who inserts a star. Great, so we can start with Shar. Hello, so I didn't, um, I'll be honest, I didn't take notes, but I think the biggest takeaway from our discussion was um, for the Boise area, we're having a hard time getting the groups to actually come together and communicate and talk. And we, you know, I'd really appreciate some tips or some ideas on how to get that communication going. Great. And then, you know, what do you, in the Boise area, what do you, what do you think those issues are, you know, probably rooted in or what, what's the, you know, I guess what's keeping people from coming together as far as you understand it? You know, it seems like there's just a, a big divide between the social um, groups and the environmental groups. Mm -hmm. so they're just not intersecting at all. Yeah, and you know, I think that's um, so that's that's not uncommon at all, right? I think through our you know work that we've been doing, especially around here, there's there's always you know been a I think a very stark divide, right, of, of amongst you know environmental groups, uh, labor, faith groups, mm -hmm. and you know 
kind of multi-issue, you know, groups as well. And, and that's where, you know, I think for, you know, the work that, that we've been doing in particular around, you know, RISE actions, um, it's been you know, critical to get folks in the room and, and try to find some, some common ground. So what I'd, I'd love to do is um, I, could, I could send you my email uh, address in the chat, my phone, and we could connect uh, offline and kind of talk through that stuff and, and get you some support for uh, bringing folks together uh, around the coalition yeah, building in Boise. That would be wonderful. Great. Thanks. Great. Uh, next we had uh, Catherine Clark. Hey. So uh, I think the biggest thing we talked about is that um, in Columbus, we reached out to the Sierra Club, um, which is a much bigger organization than what I'm part of, and asked them if they could give us any guidance on local organizations we could reach out to or um, sort of how to approach the, the issue in general. And uh, what they did is they came back and offered possible funding and resources, which is very nice. So we sort of talked about how um, if that partnership works out, what we'll be offering is sort of the boots on the ground and the uh, actual organization of the event. And then they'll be offering like advice and um, hopefully resources depending on um, what's going on with them. But uh, I've kind of struggled a little bit too with figuring out how to reach out to more local groups who aren't environmental groups as well. So I'd be interested in, in hearing more about that too. Yeah, no, same. Please do, you know, please do connect with me offline and we can talk through it. And I think you bring up a really good point, which is often, you know, it's, it's always a tense point in, in partnerships and coalition building is uh, resources, right? Like, who, like who's going to be responsible for what? How do we share those resources? Um, you know, how are they split up? And, and oftentimes um, it gets overlooked, right, in the, in the, you know, initial conversation. So I think that's, you know, great that, that you were able to connect with the Sierra Club there and and they were able to offer, you know, support and, and resources to, to build that work. Because I think when, when folks are able to, you know, organizations are able to recognize, again, like, you know, kind of talked about earlier, just those, their self-interest uh, in the work, uh, they open up a bit more, right? And, and, and they're willing to or, or able to, you know, see how by, by them investing equally in the work that everybody's come together around, um, they see how it serves their, their self-interest as well and just the greater good of, of the work that they're trying to do and, and, and their membership and their mission. So that's really, really great that they're able to plug in and, and put resources there. And, and, and similarly, you know, like I mentioned, just, you know, with the multi-issue groups, right, and, and groups who aren't necessarily the, the, the environmental and, and green organizations, um, getting them to the table is, you know, is difficult. But I think for us, you know, this year, this theme has been, you know, rise for climate jobs and justice. And I think this is the first time that we're really pulling in all the pieces, right? And, and what we're still, you know, what we've been able to do nationally, but still helping our, you know, folks on the ground who are putting on events is how do we communicate the, the jobs and justice piece, right? Because it's there, we're being intentional about it. Um, but we also have some great resources for messaging and approaching those other organizations like labor and like faith and like multi-issue groups and, and other frontline communities uh, who are, um, who should be at the table, but may not have, the message may not have been framed to them, you know, properly just yet. So I think that's definitely something we can help with. Great. And then I think lastly, we have Lisa Young. Hey, uh, this is Lisa. Um, I was in a group uh, with, oh shit, was her name Lindsay? Sorry. To, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, someone else from uh, from PCM in Brooklyn. Um, and yeah, she was sharing that the, the bulk of the work she's doing right now is uh, partnerships building and just making a lot of phone calls um, to try to make those connections and build those partnerships um, uh, kind of at the national level, it sounded like. Um, uh, in, in her capacity as a PCM uh, national organizing director. Um, and then myself here in Boston, um, similarly uh, trying to build a local planning table for uh, the RISE event on September 8th. And I worked on uh, convening the coalition that planned last year's PCM as well. And I was noting that it, it does seem to be more difficult this year for whatever reason um, that last year kind of put a call out to a bunch of groups, hey, wanna come together and see what we can do and, and like a lot of labor and environmental justice and climate and faith and youth groups um, kind of all came to the table and we, we planned something and, and executed it last year and it worked out really well and putting that same kind of call to action this year didn't result in the same 
kind of response. So I've had to do different kind of outreach tactics and definitely a lot more just targeted um, one-on-one outreach to folks um, and just, yeah, people just seem really tapped out this year, especially leading the election season. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of reasons for it. Summertime, a lot of people are out of the office, lots of things like that. So it's been a little harder, but I actually, I was saying that I appreciated the prompt because I think, um, you know, really thinking specifically about like, what are the needs of the other organization and, and asking them um, like what those needs are and like being really clear in um, oops, sorry. And being really clear, um, about what, like what those expectations are and, and how the partnership is going to meet those needs or whatever. I think, um, we could do a better job of that. I could do a better job of that. Cause I think it's been a little more vague, like, Hey, come to the table, be part of this thing. We'll make it worth your while. Or like, you know, we're open to, to lifting up your priority issues in whatever way you want. And it's kind of like vague and not very clear. And I think, um, being a little bit more clear, uh, you know, in that outreach to them and then in conversations with them and moving forward, I think would, would help a lot. Um, but yeah, I guess, um, I, I should mention that, um, Lindsay was saying that, uh, in, in her outreach, a lot of it has been around like really, yeah, clarifying what the partnership's about and making sure everyone's on the same page. So, um, that's definitely a thing I think we need to be doing more of here. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, folks are, you know, still, you know, plugging along in, in Boston and, and, you know, putting something together again this year. And, and like you mentioned, I, I think there are a plethora of things that keep people from, you know, that are easy to keep people from being engaged. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, Labor Day week, right? Week after Labor Day, people are going back to school, the midterm, like everybody's committed to, you know, uh, GOTV and just kind of, so there's a, there's a ton of things going on. And, and I think you bring up a great point and Lindsay brings up a great point uh, in that um, it's so critical to have a very clear message this time around, right? Cause it's easy to say, um, you know, we've been seeing these, you know, marches for four or five years now, right? These big marches and local marches for four or five years, folks are going to be asking what makes, what makes this year different, right? What makes this year different? And it's going to be so critical to say um, what makes this year different for you, right? Like we have our national frame and every, you know, Every folks, every you know, organization who are putting on you know September eighth events around the country and around the world are, are you know need to be thinking through the message of what makes this different and why does your organization like why should they be at the table this time this year at this critical moment because it is a pivotal moment right um, you know for climate action uh, in our country and just globally so I think it's it's critical to get clear on on why those groups in your state do right why they should be at the table. Thank you for sharing that. So if you all want to turn your attention back to the slides, we have you know one more slide in this component, um, and then I'll pass it back to Umi. But so for this you know portion of of the agenda, um, you know we're just going to talk a bit about like what you know partnerships are. So we we kind of laid out um, you know the the, the function and, and, and purpose and, and what we need to be getting out of these partnerships, but. Also, just thinking of what are the different types of partnerships. So we talked a bit about coalitions. That's the most common one, but, you know, important to understand that every, you know, every sort of partnership isn't uh, a coalition, right? So what are the different partnerships uh, that, you know, are geared towards building power? So the first one being uh, an alliance, right, which is a strategic partnership that seeks long-term uh, power change, right, not short-term resolutions to a problem. And I think the, the thing that separates this one from, most of the others is, is, is just that, right? The, the same that is long term, right? So we aren't looking for, um, you know, quick, quick hits, right? Quick media hits or, or quick actions, although that may be a part of a, a campaign component, but it's understanding that when organizations come together, it's for the, the purpose of, of building long term power and building long term relationships for, um, you know, long term systemic change. You know, the next one there is, is coalitions, which, you know, probably are the, the most uh, common, right? And, and, and in many situations are, you know, we're probably all part of different, you know, various coalitions that are moving work and, uh, you know, that type of partnership, uh, you know, seeks to win specific demands rather than create a long-term uh, shift in power. And that's something that, you know, I think people's climate movement and a number of organizations nationally are looking at, right? Like how do we pivot from just being a coalition of, of organizations that comes together for, you know, one day of action or a few days of action, you know, throughout the year, but actually, you know, seek to win, um, you know, specific demands, uh, you know, even if it's not long-term, you know, we're having specific demands, not just 
exercising power in the form of, of public actions. Um, you also have coordinated campaigns, which you know, our partners have a specific demand they ask, you know, they seek to win. Uh, they do not pursue it in a joint campaign, right? So organizations develop their own campaign plan and they coordinate activities uh, for maximum impact. And it's just that, right? It's, it's, so we talked about, you know, oftentimes we're organizations that are doing work in our silos and, and when we reach out to others and build relationships is for the purpose of building power. But it's also important to understand that, that sometimes, you know, organizations may not have the self-interest or capacity to commit to a, you know, either long-term, um, you know, long-term coalition or, or, or long-term alliance, but rather, you know, they would prefer to, to implement their campaign plan, do their own thing, but is there a way that they can do it uh, or you can do it in collaboration with somebody that allows you to coordinate, literally coordinate your events to have maximum purpose. And, and really, I guess, you know, best phrase for me is compliment, right? Is there a way we can organize to compliment one another without having to sacrifice our mission and the work that we're doing to, to just, you know, combine and do one thing together. And then lastly, is just the kind of the sign on campaigns or what we call paper coalitions, which are, you know, one organization runs a campaign and it gets formal support uh, first demands through pledges, you know, letter of support, sign on letter, et cetera. And we see this a lot, um, oftentimes through distributive organizing, distributive actions, and, um, you know, and, and, and many other sign on campaigns, right? Whether it's, it's petition support or pledge cards, voter pledge cards, you know, things like that. It's, you know, essentially an organization is going to be lead, they're going to be out front, they're going to be running it, but they're asking for the support of stakeholders, organizations, and community members to say, you know, this is the organization that we're supporting. This is the organization that we're defaulting to, to, to be our voice on this issue. Um, and these are the demands that we you know, necessarily agree with by signing off uh, on this campaign. Right. And next we have, how do you, you know, approach right, outreach and, and build plans, right? So the significant portion here is just simply to know um, exactly what you want from a partnership, right? And we talked a bit about this, you know, a few minutes ago with, with report back, but also early on is just, um, not only bringing to the bringing people to the table and, and trying to understand their self interests, but also communicating yours, right? And understanding up front, you know, you know, what do you want to get out of this, right? Not just um, you know putting coalitions and partnerships together and then kind of trying to figure it out. Because I see that happen, you know, happen fairly often where people think they should be working with other other people for whatever reason, but when they get together, they haven't fully thought about what they want from the partnership and they spend time. Uh, spinning their spinning their wheels uh, and never actually getting to a point of uh, action and clarity and, and demand. So, um, you know, making sure that you know exactly what you want, uh, that you invest time and resources in understanding potential partner organizations, and of course, you know, building relationships. Uh, the other component of that is just you know building accountability and trust uh, through direct and honest communication. I think that's one of the most difficult things to do amongst organizations that oftentimes um, seem to be competing. Right. There are many times with whether it's local organizations or national organizations who are coalescing around the same issues. They're focused on the same targets. They have the same demands. But yet, you know, there are things, wedges, barriers that come between them uh, actually working together meaningfully. Right. In a, in a way that actually gets stuff done. And uh, rather it's like we talked about the sharing of resources, literally the sharing of data and information, um, you know, determining who's going to be responsible for what commitments. Uh, it's just, you know, critical that you come to the table with, you know, a sense of open and honest communication and making sure that you're in a position to build trust with the organizations that you're inviting uh, to be a part of that partnership. Because if there's no trust, I mean, you, you know, they really won't get anything done. And that, I think that's just an essential like, component of relationship building, period, whether it's one-to-one -one or organizational. Uh, and then one of the, you know, thoughts were, you know, what some organizations do, like they go as far as building a, a, a memorandum of understanding, right, an MOU to, to clearly state how a partnership will function and, you know, what goals and objectives will be. Um, and then, you know, do what they say they will, right? It's literally probably just like a contract of this is what we're agreeing to. Um, this is what we said we're going to do. This is the time frame we're going to do it in. Uh, it's a good tool to always come back to when, you know, things do get a little hazy or confused or, begin to kind of fall off as kind of a little reminder of, um, you know, what we committed to do, um, you know, as a partnership. And, and sometimes that makes sense, right? Especially when you have a, you know, maybe it's a few organizations working together where it's a bit more intimate or in depth and, or if there's, you know, certain, you know, information and, and data being shared, right? Having that MOU together. Uh, but in other situations, it may not be, right? Um, it just, I think it's important to, to know your relationship with your partners, know that, you know, the level of trust there, rather something like that is, important. Um, 
And then lastly, you know, just best practices to include and, and amplify communities of color. And, and we talked a bit about intersectionality when we did at the, you know, at the beginning of this presentation. And I think that's a component that we just, you know, really can't stress enough, right? You know, communities of color, but then just, just thinking of, you know, underserved or, or, or oppressed communities, you know, generally, right? What are we doing and, and, and how can we continue to, to pull them into these stakeholder coalitions and meetings to make sure their voices are lifted up? So, you know, the, the main thing is, is right, refer to those mass principles, you know, democratic organizing that we talked about at the beginning of this call, right? Making sure that uh, you have identified all stakeholders, frontline communities, et cetera, and reach out, right, to include, you know, all to be represented at the table. Uh, so that's something to, you know, consider, you know, really consider when, when doing this work and, um, and just, you know, the little note, the, you know, link in your, in your slides uh, to those mass principles, if you haven't seen them, right, and just, uh, you know, the nudge to, incorporate all those principles as needed right but i mean they should always be needed so you should be incorporating all of them throughout you know your your work uh of partnership and, and coalition building and and building you know diverse and sustainable uh, you know coalitions and so are there any any questions great so i will Pass it back to Umi for, and you know, just a, a prime example of, 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 you know, what partnership and coalition building looks like. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, awesome. Yes. So we're gonna check out an example video, um, and yeah, take a little break from the talking, and actually watch a little video, um, just to give you guys a little bit of context. So thinking about everything Jeremy has said about the best practices and what we need to be thinking about when we're working in coalition. Um, this video is a fantastic um, video that highlights the divestment campaign in New York and all the coalition work that happened um, behind the scenes to make it happen um, and kind of talks about that. So if you are on a computer, um, if you wanna, instead of playing it through Zoom, if you actually wanna click the YouTube link that's on the slide, on slide 12, um, or in the chat that Amira just posted, that would be great. Um, and if you're on the phone, if you just wanna um, do a search Search on YouTube for Divest New York, anything is possible. That should bring up the video. Um, so if you just want to spend five minutes right now um, watching the video, that would be great. And then we'll um, talk a little bit about that after the video. If anyone has any problems or IT issues, um, just feel free to type in the chat.
All right, has everyone had a chance to watch the video? Is there anyone still watching the video? Um, what we'll do then is we'll move on to slide 13. So um, that was obviously a video that was about the campaign in New York and how they came together. Um, and Jeremy's given us a lot of best practices to reflect on when thinking about the coalition work that you're going to be doing locally. But based on what you've been reflecting on from that video and the conversations that we've had, um, are there any best practices that you would add or that you've been reflecting on that you need to start thinking about in your local outreach? Um, feel free to just type those in directly into the slide. Um, or if you want to share them out loud, you can unmute yourself and talk um, or type it into the chat. It's just an opportunity for us to share some ideas about what you're thinking about um, for your next steps. Oh, and actually, yes, Chris, I wanted to address your comment as well. That is absolutely true. Um, yes, and Jeremy, Jeremy is echoing that, so it's good. that makes me feel more confident. Um, but yes, that is a fantastic way to work in partnership with someone and to recognize the connection between issues is by actually engaging with people on a genuine level. So when thinking about the Hamez principles, it's that working together in solidarity and mutuality and building those just relationships. So you've encapsulated that perfectly. And I can see that someone has typed that in there, show for other groups, events, and causes, solidarity. That's absolutely right. We're all, we're all working together. We've all got specific interests that we're trying to move forward, and we have to work collaboratively to do that. So that's absolutely right. Is there anything else that people are thinking of or any questions that have come up for you um, over the past hour? Um, I guess one that, that I'll share, it's easier for me to share out loud, I guess, than, um, than typing on my phone right now, um, is the, the general best practice of, of like bringing groups to the table and kind of like starting from the beginning in terms of building a campaign or an event. Um, uh, with those groups rather than coming up with the idea yourself and then trying to get other groups to endorse or join on after the fact, um, uh, particularly in terms of like including the voices of those most affected in the very initial um, like visioning and creation of, again, the campaign or the event or whatever it is. Um, and like to me that that is a really clear like principle, um, uh, but uh, difficult to do in practice uh, as most things are. And uh, that's been something that I think we've been struggling with a little bit um, here in Boston um, because kind of as I noted earlier, I think last year it was a little bit easier where all the groups were willing to come to the table for that kind of initial visioning and we were able to build something together. And we're, we're, we're on the road to doing a similar thing like that this year, but it's been a little harder and because of just, you know, it, us getting closer to the day of the action, um, we've had to like do some of that brainstorming, um, I think, you know, without having the voices in the room that we that we would want to but like we were still in the middle of doing that outreach and trying to get those people to the table so like kind of having to do that at the same time and as as we're bringing those voices to the table definitely asking for their input and feedback and and modifying the the action proposal as needed and like you know bringing that in as much as possible and trying not to go too fast um in terms of you know making the action plan and then trying to get partners uh secondary to that but it's it's been a little bit more like in parallel um, uh, and just, just because of because of the time because September 8th is coming up and we um, yeah so I don't know that's something to struggle with and I don't know uh, if anyone wants to comment on that like best practice of getting everyone to the table first and then talking about what to do once they're all at the table and just how difficult that is in practice. I think that's a really good point you raise, and I'm sure Jeremy has additional thoughts um, on this as well. But it is it is the the tension that we exist in, where like we want us we we have a timeline and we're trying to meet that, but equally we want to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible and that everyone feels like their voice is being heard and that they're able to contribute. Um, and so, sorry, sorry, getting a bit of thank you, um, and so I think that's where um, the the conversations about the relationship and about um, where people 
um, are able to contribute and where decisions have already been made are so important, um, especially if it is that you're doing things in, in parallel, where you know if X, Y, and Z has already been determined and that's it, the date's selected, the time's selected, there's not too much flexibility on that. Having those open, honest conversations from the onset, instead of saying, oh no, everything is, we're all gonna work collaboratively to make these decisions. Um, I, I've, I've found in the work that I've done previously that at least helps manage people's expectations about what they can and can't contribute on um, and what is um, capable for them to actually influence, um, which just makes them feel more a part of the um, partnership and a part of the coalition. But equally then also that if you continue to build that relationship, they'll recognize that they'll be able to contribute further um, as the campaign continues because the 8th of September is not the end. It's a moment for us, but we're gonna keep fighting together. So how do we keep standing together in unity and how do we keep, keep building those relationships and how do we start those honest conversations from the onset? Um, but those are just my thoughts. So like if anyone else has anything to contribute, we'd love to, to hear. No further thoughts on that one? Um, okay, cool. Um, I've noticed that some people have typed some best practices in, which are really exciting. Um, so when the campaign slash event climaxes with the big speech, don't be the one to speak. Let those whose voices are not heard often speak. Fantastic. Um, if your organization has the resources like time and money, then offer yourselves a support for campaigns rather than leading them, particularly if the other orgs don't have those resources. Um, so for instance, low income, immigrant groups, etc. Absolutely. Um, like Jeremy was saying, there's a lot of institutional power that can be utilized to support other organizations. Um, it was very heartening as a Sierra Club staff member to hear that that's what we're doing in Ohio um, and that that is something that the institution is actually echoing because we do talk about it a lot. Um, so that sort of recognition is phenomenal. Um, meet people where they're at, um, listen to them and honor their needs and interests, absolutely. Um, and talk to other groups since the beginning of planning a campaign, which is absolutely true, but as Lisa did mention, sometimes um, that doesn't work out. So how do we maintain um, those levels of trust and accountability in that process? Those are fantastic best practices. Are there any um, further that people have or anything else that people um, want to reflect on before I hand it back over to Amira? No? Okay, I'll uh, hand it back over. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks everyone for the awesome best practices. I love all these ideas. Um, uh, so thank you for joining this call. Um, I just want to remind you that all the materials and the recording for this training will be available at this website here on slide 14. And I also copied the link on the chat. Um, and if you missed any other trainings from past weeks, um, you can check those out and also sign up for the next upcoming trainings in the following weeks. Um, and before we go, um, it would be great if you could type in the chat, uh, what's one thing that you're taking away from this call? If you could say it in three or four words, what's that one thing that stood out from, from this training space? And if you are on the phone or don't have your keyboard accessible, feel free to take yourself off mute also. And let us know what's one thing that you're taking away from this call. We need systemic change. So we need groups from all parts of the system to make the change or something paraphrased. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. 
open and honest communication with partners to build trust and accountability and share expectations. Um, investment in potential partners before you go knocking on their doors for support. Get out and engage. Open and honest communication. These are all great. Um, and uh, um, just thank you everyone for joining and thank you to this pretty awesome trainers. Um, and uh, I hope you have a lovely night or afternoon, uh, depending on what part of the world or time zone you're in. And thanks for joining. Have a nice evening. Thanks, folks. That was really good. Bye. Thank you. Bye.